um, my name is Uko Grosnan, and I would like to talk about application embedding, which is a declarative approach to uh, web programming. So, if nothing else, I'd like you to come up with this, uh, from this presentation with two takeaways. One is the idea that web applications are actually domain-specific languages. And the other is that the first takeaway, it actually has practical implications. Let's start with the first one. So, usually when we're talking about web applications and DSLs, we talk about things like HTML and CSS, or a bunch of server-side DSLs that were created in order to help us create web applications. But in this particular talk, I'm not going to talk about any of these. Instead, I'm going to try to convince you that web applications are actually DSL. So if we have a set of all computer languages, and in that, a subset of that is a set of all domain specific computer languages, I'm trying to convince you that web application is a subset of that. So that if you take Facebook, for example, Facebook is a language which happens to be domain specific. Um, first, as a first uh, stage, I'll try to convince you that um, web applications are generally computer languages. So what's an application? An application is a combination of data, uh, some database schema, uh, presentation, and business logic, which itself comprises of uh, access control and the part that, for, better, for lack of a better name, we'll call it doing something, the, what the application actually does. No. On the other hand, what is the language? A language is a combination of syntax, which has its uh, abstract and concrete parts, and semantics, which has static and dynamic parts. Now, in a way, uh, database schema and abstract syntax are very similar, in the sense that, <coughs> sorry, uh, in the sense that they both define types of things. Uh, the types of the things that go into a database or the type of things that go into a program. The presentation, like the concrete syntax, gives human readable form to those things. Access control tells us what can and cannot go into a database or can or cannot go to a program beyond what the syntax or, or the database schema allows us to do. And by doing something with our data, by doing something with um, statuses and friendships, for example, um, we actually give our data uh, its meaning, its dynamic semantics. <coughs> so we actually compare the data in an application to the program in a programming language. Now, this is uh, just a, nothing but a special case to a very well-established principle in computer science. This guy, for example, made a career out of telling people that uh, pro programs are actually data. And that guy um, defined this uh, um, found a way to represent numbers as functions, which is another way of saying that data is actually a program. So, Having established that, the, that applications are languages, why are they domain specific? They're domain specific, so to, to understand that, let's go into a schema. So what's in a schema for an application? So if it's something like Facebook, we'll have statuses, friendships, and likes. If it's something like uh, Twitter, we'll have tweets and followers. If, we, if it's something like, I don't know, eBay, we'll have products, inventory, orders, buyers, sellers, this kind of stuff which are all <coughs> domain concepts. And if we agree that the database schema is actually an abstract syntax, that means that the, the language constructs that we have in those languages are domain specific, <coughs> making the language a DSL. So I hope that it, at that point I kind of convinced you that uh, web applications are DSLs. Now let's see what kind of practical implications this understanding can have. So 
so in order, so I first want to talk about well applications. Why do I want to talk about well applications? Well, because they are everywhere. They are a big part of everyone's life today. But as much as they are a big part of our life, they are hardly they're ever done right. Think of, about all the um, mediocre well applications that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life and how few really good web applications you, you encounter and for those few what is the amount of resources that have been poured on them like the size of the company making them so they are complex what do I mean when I'm saying that they are complex well the word complex comes from the archaic verb to complex which is to uh, entwine or interleave or tangle. So what is tangled in web applications? So one thing that is tangled is the functional requirements, which is the, what the application needs to do, the uh, schema, presentation, and business logic. And the other thing that we tangle the functional requirements with are the extra functional requirements. Things like performance, scalability, availability, and more. How do I know that these things are tangled? Well, that's because the design of a web application relies heavily on the extra functional requirements. For example, take a small-scale application. A reasonable design will include a relational database, uh, which will be normalized, so no redundancy in the data, and we'll use a high-level uh, web framework, something like Ruby on Rails. Now, take the same, the exact same application, this, the exact same functional requirements, just increase the scale to very large scale. The design of that application will probably change significantly to, for example, use a NoSQL database, which will be heavily denormalized, so the application will have to maintain redundancy in the data, and the assumptions made by most of the uh, most uh, high-level frameworks, like Ruby Rails, usually do not hold at scale. So we will end up using <coughs> lower-level frameworks, things like Express.js. So I want to look at this problem from a software user perspective. I want to uh, take the um, artifact, the code artifact, that make up a web application and divide them into these four quadrants according to the following axes. The first axis is going to be application uh, specific versus application agnostic. This is under the assumption that, the, that application agnostic uh, things are not uh, related to any of my functional requirements. Only the application specific parts are. And the other uh, dimension is imperative versus declarative artifacts. So, because imperative artifacts are probably related to things like performance and scalability, like extra functional requirements, and declarative things are not. So I will be especially interested in this uh, yellow box here, because this is where things can be tangled, functional and extra functional requirements. So when we're looking at a, um, a web application today, the database that is being used and web frameworks, they are all imperative, but application agnostic. So they are being reused across applications. They have a lot um, of influence on how, how performant is my application or how well it scales, but have nothing to do with the functional requirements of my particular application. There are things like CSS frameworks, which are both declarative and application agnostic. There aren't many of those, and they're not very important for this uh, discussion. Things like static HTML pages, CSS, and templates, if you're using a, a declarative template language, are declarative and application uh, specific. So they are coupled with the functional requirements for my application, but usually have no effect on performance or scalability. But there is one big thing in the yellow box, and that's the business logic. And this is where functional and extra functional requirements 
are being tangled, and that's the, the part that is really hard to get right. What we present in the paper uh, is an approach, is a different um, separation of code assets. What we propose is to use an application platform or a host application, which will be imperative but application agnostic, so it can be reused across applications, um, and will of course handle the extra functional requirements. And the declarative application definition, which holds all the um, application specific parts. Now, we really, really want the yellow box to be empty. Unfortunately, this is a, in the real world, it cannot be really empty. So we want to keep it as small as possible. And the only parts that wait, sorry, have to be there are the uh, user interactions. So when a user clicks a button, there had to, so some action needs to be performed on the client side. And the best way to express this kind of uh, action is imperatively. But this has very little to do with the extra functional requirements for the, for the uh, application. It has uh, very little influence on performance or scalability of the overall application. So, um, we coined the term application embedding, which we define as the implementation of uh, embedded applications, uh, or an embedded application is payload or is data over a host application. The intuition comes from DSL embedding, which is, um, which is applied on web applications. So, that was a little fast. What did I mean by that? So, to, uh, to explain that, I need to take two details. The in the first, I'm going to talk to you about DSLs and how they are implemented and how these concerns are uh, being, uh, hand being uh, handled there. So, surprisingly or not, DSLs also have functional and extra functional requirements. The functional requirements uh, include the syntax and the semantics for the DSL. The extra functional requirements uh, include things like runtime performance uh, and tooling around the DSL, things like syntax highlighting, uh, debuggers, and more. Um, so how do DSL developers handle this tanglement of functional and extra functional requirements? And the answer is that it depends. It depends heavily on how these DSLs are being uh, implemented. The most naive approach to DSL implementation is external DSLs. Things like, well, DSLs like HTML, CSS, SQL. And there, the answer is every man to himself. Uh, if you embark on this um, adventure of creating your own browser, implementing HTML and CSS on the way, you should seriously consider providing tools for debugging um, inspecting HTML and CSS, because if you don't, chances are that uh, web developers will not target your DSL in their applications. <coughs> Another approach uh, is the use of language workbench, things like MTS, XTEX, or SQLFAX. These can be seen as frameworks for implementing DSLs along with their tools. So you're still responsible for putting together the, the DSL and all the related tools, but you're doing it from within a framework that takes away much of the uh, work that you need to do. A third approach is DSL embedding or internal DSLs. These are, um, <coughs> which is embedding a DSL as a library over a host language. So, for example, if you use brackets, as your host language, and you embed a DSL uh, over it. Your DSL is a library in Racket, and uh, your and your DSL code is actually Racket code. So when you do this, you reuse all the tools that are already created around Racket. They just work with your uh, DSL. So if we are looking at a uh, declarative host language, and we look at the uh, code artifacts around 
uh, around an internal DSL, you'll see that the host language and its tools are probably written in some imperative programming language, but they are agnostic of my DSL. So they are written once, and I can use them for any DSL that I want to write. The DSL definition itself is declarative, but DSL specific, obviously. And the intersection is empty, which is exactly the kind of code separation that I want to achieve. So the question is, what's the big idea? If we agree that domain specific uh, that web applications are domain specific languages. And we've seen that domain specific languages can be uh, created uh, using DSL embedding in a way that uh, creates the code separation, the separation of code assets that we want. Can we do the same thing for uh, web applications? And the answer is yes. And it is already being done today in, code, in content management systems. So what happened, what's content management systems? These are computer applications that support the creation and modification of digital content. Examples include WordPress, Drupal, and MediaWiki, which is the software with, uh, behind Wikipedia. If we look at uh, content management systems and how the, the code assets for a particular site being uh, created over some uh, CMS, you'll see something very similar to what you want. The uh, CMS implementation itself is imperative. For example, all the examples that I gave on the previous slide are written in PHP, which is an imperative language. <coughs> but they're site agnostic. They're not made for, for our site. They know nothing about our site. Um, they can be massively reused. There are th things like uh, themes and styles, which are um, which are both declarative and site agnostic. Again, not very important for this uh, discussion. The site itself, the content of the site, and settings, like who is allowed to do what on this site, are all declarative and site specific. And again, the yellow box is empty. So, um, <coughs> so content management systems, features, uh, what we want, what features application embedding. So in WordPress, uh, the host application is the CMS itself, like WordPress. Um, and the embedded application is the site or the blog that we build on top of WordPress. Now, it has uh, some very strong pros. For example, extra functional requirements, like performance scalability, are handled um, are handled exclusively by the CMS. So when I'm building a site, I do the same thing exactly, regardless of whether there is one person per day who is going to visit it, or a million. The other thing is that it can be provided as a service. So I don't even have to worry about getting, it, um, getting a server running and connecting it to the web. Um, but they already also have a very big con, and that's the fact that they are very, very limited in the business logic that they provide us. So, uh, with, in the extreme case, a static website has absolutely no uh, business logic. So, what do we want? We want to have the same benefits that we get from uh, content management systems, but we really want them to. But apart for um, apart for uh, content, we want to also be able to feed that platform, that uh, the host application, to feed it uh, our business logic and to have, be able to address any business logic. And the answer for that is a general purpose host application. So what is a general purpose host application? <coughs> so again, imagine the set of all computer languages. Domain specific languages are a subset. And now, web applications are a subset of that, of computer languages where the vast majority is still a subset of domain specific languages. 
including WordPress and CMSs, because they are specific to the domain of content management. But there is a tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, piece of web applications that extend beyond domain-specific languages, which contains general-purpose programming languages, uh, web applications, sorry, including one piece of related work named CouchDB, and our very own fish tank. <coughs> so what is fish tank? Fish tank is the proof of concept that we provided in our paper. It is a host application, so it is a platform on top of which you can define, define and develop uh, web applications. It implements um, a language named Cloudo, which, since it is corresponding to uh, to a language, to a computer language, that computer language is named Cloudo. So what's Cloudo? It's a logic programming data language. You think data log, if you will. It consists of three kinds of axioms: facts, which are data elements, uh, rules, and clauses. Clauses are um, evaluated at query time, and rules are evaluated at the time. The evaluation is always the same, always comments. So let's take a look at a small microblogging computer like example. So we have facts, things like Alice follows Bob, and tweets like Bob tweeted hello. And then we have, uh, as our business logic, we have this one rule, saying basically that if one user follows another user, and the other user created the tweet, then the timeline of the first user will include that tweet. So, fish tank is based on a, so we, we define a theoretical model, a computational model named the fish tank model, which basically looks at these facts and rules like fish in a big fish tank. So you see this uh, rule being a female fish in the fish tank, and there is the fact that Alice follows Bob as a male fish in the fish tank. Now, because the um, because uh, the fact matches the left hand side of the rule, they match and create an offspring matching the right hand side of the rule which happens to be a rule by itself, so it's a female fish. When that female fish finds a matching fact in the fish tank, they also uh, produce an offspring. This offspring now is a clause. It, is not, it cannot have children of itself, of its own, but it can be queried. Clauses can be uh, queried, picked up by queries. So when, we, when Alice queries for her timeline, she will see that result. Now, the nice thing about this model is that the order of operation doesn't change the end result. So if the tweet came in before Alice started following Bob, it will wait in the fish tank until everything comes together and we will still have the same result. Similarly, the rule can come after the facts are already there, and there you can see that the same result will happen. Now, this looks very trivial here, but in traditional web applications, this is a very big problem. It's called data migration. How do you change, how do you upgrade the application where you already have data in your database? Um, of course, when you remove something from a fish tank, all its descendants are removed. So you have that, you have a situation where the our queries for the results for all the queries um, are reflected only by what is currently uh, the raw facts that are open right now in the fish tank. So uh, we implemented um, fish tank. Uh, we use the mean architecture, which uh, includes a MongoDB database, uh, Node.js or Express.js for the logic tier. And we have an Angular JS plugin for the um, for the client side. So, um, and you and you'll have more information about this in the paper, alongside a formal definition of the fish tank model, 
uh, an evaluation in the form of a Twitter-like uh, example, which is uh, more elaborate than what I've seen here today, uh, and discussion of applicability, correctness, and performance. You'll also find discussion of related work, including uh, application embedding and multi-tier or uh, tierless uh, programming. To conclude, I think I convinced you that uh, web applications are domain-specific languages. Um, and I've shown you that it has practical implications. So web applications can be declarative. And there is a separation of concerns. The, app, the application definition holds all the functional requirements, while the host application handles all extra functional requirements. Thank you very much. So I, I was just curious because you gave quite a narrow example of CMS and like the WordPress where we can just mainly do a blog, right? But what about uh, more general CMS like Sitecore and Umbrella? Aren't they also providing this sort of application embedding? And I know you still use ASP.NET and uh, C Sharp for business logic, but still how much of this business logic can you put to purely declarative and not somehow relay and meet on a, uh, some C sharp. I, since I don't know this, I will uh, uh, find you after the talk okay. and, and okay. I'll try to get yeah, this uh, variety of work and make my comments. I have a related question. What's the, the most complex web application that you have tried with this? Oh. <laughs> uh, so, the, the furthest that I went with was a Twitter-like application, but it did have a feature like uh, uh, hashtags. Like it, it would uh, reason on the, the, the text itself. Uh, you could uh, search for hashtags. You can uh, link to uh, users mentioned in, uh, in, in, in tweets and, and this kind of thing. And how often can you get all these fish? Because if you can get very, very, very many. <laughs> um, so the, the, the uh, logic stayed uh, pretty straightforward. The logic part, uh, the rules are pretty straightforward and they are in the paper. Uh, I mean, I have more or less full source code of the example uh, in the paper. I, um, uh, of the logic. I omitted some of the tag definitions and stuff like that, but, but, the, lo but the logic is all there. Um, and I also use uh, unit tests that are that test the logic and without putting things into the, the <coughs> tank so that you can uh, reason about oh, the logic itself without the without having the uh, platform in the equation. Um, so basically, you usually have the CMS in the Twitter, uh, but what about applications that impose some kind of custom process? Like, let's, let's say either way you have a, a long process, um, when you want to bid for something, buy something, and then you have to be included in the system. How do you realize such applications? Um, I need to relate to, to a specific thing, but um, so. What I've shown here does not include the um, integrity and uh, confidentiality parts that this has. Uh, a, work, uh, a, flow, a workflow, like what, what you're uh, presenting, he is, de depends heavily on that. But, um, I, but I did this mental exercise of how do I do like bug tracking or things that have a workflow. And, and it does matter. Uh, they, they do matter. Basically, every operation that you have is a fact that you uh, that you produce, and there is a rule that matches well what kind of state I was in before, and and there is a, and if you have that fact, then you are in a new state now. Something like that. 
All right, so I'll, I'll cut it here. Thank you.